I'm sure you've heard of Bitcoin mining and maybe you have seen all of these nice pictures where somebody goes to a gold mine and then in the background you have some computer chips and so on. And even myself, I'm also guilty of that because some of the doodles we've used, you can also see somebody mining. So it is a nice analogy, I'm not going to lie. But in this lecture, I will actually show what is behind Bitcoin mining. We will talk about how the network can reach a consensus and look into the proof of work consensus protocol. All right, let's get started and talk about the proof of work consensus mechanism. And the proof of work is essentially what allows Bitcoin to reach a consensus, to reach a common understanding on the current state of the ledger. Now recall last time when we talked about block assembly, uh, I ended with a, a slide where I've shown you um, that um, essentially when we don't add any further restrictions, everyone can create blocks in such an efficient manner uh, that they essentially will end up just working on their own version. Uh, the reason for that was that mm, you can create new blocks, you can make new proposal of Canada blocks much faster than you actually can exchange the data. Okay, so before you're receiving Canada blocks from anyone else, before you can propose Canada blocks to anyone else, uh, it's just much more efficient when everyone just keeps working on their own, on their own version of the blockchain. And that is a really bad position to be in. I mean, we have seen at the end of the last slide deck that this would lead to a situation where everyone has their own understanding on the current truth, on the current state of the ledger. So what we need now is uh, we need a way to slow that process down artificially. I mean, we have an activity that can be executed too fast, too quickly. Uh, and now we must find a certain way, a decentralized way that allows us uh, to slow down that process in order for the network to be able to catch up and to exchange the information um, before new information is created. So we must be able to exchange newly created blocks faster then each miner is able to create new blocks, obviously. In the second situation, if we, if we couldn't ensure that, then each and every one would just create their own blocks and we would have the same problem uh, that we have discussed at the end of the last slide deck. So the way this is done in a decentralized manner uh, is by adding a probabilistic trial and error task. So you're saying that instead of just accepting every single one of these blocks, uh, you have this trial and error task and the block, the candidate block, will only be accepted by uh, the peers of whoever has created this block if the uh, person who has created it can provide some proof that on average um, he or she has expended a certain amount of resources. So that is essentially where the name is coming from, proof of work. You have to prove that you have expended a certain amount of resources uh, for your block, um, for, for having a chance of your block being accepted. Okay, so this is this probabilistic trial and error task. Uh, you will see how it is constructed. But what is important to understand is that only a very small fraction of tries, only a very small fraction of whenever somebody is assembling these blocks will eventually succeed, will succeed and will be added to the blockchain as a successful blocks. And this really is in addition to all of the cryptographic proofs we have talked about earlier. So even if you if you have only valid transactions in there, even if you only reference unspent transaction outputs, even if all of the, the cryptographic proofs, so the script six are valid, in addition to that, you also have to prove that you have um, expended a certain amount of resources on average when you're creating these blocks. And that is the idea that the, that's the way how this block creation is uh, slowed down artificially in order to allow for this uh, uh, for the network to reach a consensus by exchanging this data. So the concept uh, goes back to a 1993 paper of that work and Naur and they used this uh, very similar approach actually um, to combat spam email and denial of service attacks. Uh, there again, you have an activity that, that can be conducted, executed way too fast than is sending email. Um, most people, when they're using email in a legitimate way, they will never reach any capacity constraints. You, you maybe have a few dozens or maybe a few hundred mails a day. Um, but, um, I mean, capacity-wise, email can do much, much more than that. And there are certain people, uh, spammers, who are actually trying to use that. 
uh, sending spam links, trying to sell Viagra, uh, sending links to malware, and they're really relying on the law of large numbers. So, so um, most people will not click on these links. Most people will not buy the Viagra. Uh, but when you're sending out a sufficiently large number of these emails, you will eventually find somebody uh, who, by by sheer by sheer accident or uh, because the person doesn't pay attention, will click on your link or maybe they're dumb enough to buy your Viagra. So you're really relying on this large on these large numbers um, when you're when you're when you're doing something like that when you're conducting an attack like this. Now. Uh, the proposal of Dwork and Noir was that mm, once you add a certain challenge uh, to these emails, so when you're saying whenever somebody sends a mail in order for it to be accepted by the by the uh, uh, receiving server, uh, it must contain a solution to a certain challenge. It must contain a solution to a trial and error task. Uh, they wanted to combat. Uh, these these issues. So the, the reason behind that, or the reasoning was that when you're just uh, send an occasional email, let's say, or even when you do that for work in a legitimate way, then you will not be bothered when you have to uh, expend like a second of computing resources whenever you're sending an email. But when you're a spammer and you want to send millions and millions of email, then this can slow you down significantly. So this could be uh, quite a challenge for, for people who are trying to send spam email. And that was the idea of the paper. And as you will see, um, this is exactly uh, the, the idea of slowing of slowing the process down is exactly what I also employed in proof of work and it also the, the implementation that we will look into later on is exactly what has been used in the context of this paper. Uh, so it goes full circle back to somebody that has been proposed in 1993 in a completely different context and uses it now for a consensus protocol in a distributed lecture. So uh, one thing I'd like to mention right here, uh, we will talk about that in, uh, in one of the la later videos. Um, there are other consensus protocols, of course, other consensus mechanisms um, like proof of stake, like more centralized ones, for example, proof of authority, where it's heavily centralized. And all of these consensus protocols have their pros and cons. And of course, also proof of work has its uh, fair share of criticism. Uh, for example, with, with uh, respect to energy consumption, but it still has its place and it is widely used. Uh, it's uh, arguably the most decentralized one of these consensus protocols, and uh, it has certain benefits in terms of simplicity. Uh, with many of the other consensus protocols, you have some uh, to rely on some assumptions. Um, there are there may be a larger number of potential attack vectors because they are really complicated. And with proof of work, it's quite simple, as you will see. So what we are, are about to look at this is actually quite uh, easy to understand and not at all uh, complicated. And therefore, it uh, doesn't have, at least in theory, too many attack vectors when compared to other uh, more sophisticated consensus protocols. So how does it work? How do you actually implement it? Uh, in the Bitcoin protocol, proof of work is implemented through the use of block header hash values. So recall last time when we have assembled uh, these block headers, I've shown you all of the contents, I've shown you the Merkle root that represents all of the transactions, the nonce, and all of these other uh, contents, components that are part of the block header. And what you're doing now is you're taking the entire block header, you're taking all of these contents, put this number essentially that, that represents the block header, that is the block header, so the entire information that can be represented by a number into the hash function and you will end up with a hash value of the block header. So again, you're making this proposal, you have your, your block, the block you're assembling with all of its contents, and then you're taking the block header and you're computing the hash value um, on this on this, on this this block header, okay? So you're taking the block header as the input in your hash function, you're ending up with a hash value. And the hash value you're using is DSHA-256, so uh, double SHA, um, and Mm, there are certain criteria. So the question now is, how do we establish this trial and error task? Okay, and on a very high level, uh, what you have to understand is obviously these uh, hash values, even though they are deterministic, they seem to be random. So you cannot anticipate what you're getting, uh, as I have described in the lecture about hash functions. So uh, you're just starting with some some content. You're just starting with your block. Uh, header, and then you have to see 
what you end up with. You cannot anticipate what you end up with. Okay, and then you have a, a certain properties um, that you're looking for. So we're, we are defining that the resulting hash values have to satisfy certain properties and they will only be accepted if they are actually satisfying these properties. Now more specifically what you're doing, more specifically how this is implemented is uh, you're saying that the hash value must be below a certain threshold value. If and only if the hash value that is, that is resulting from your block header, so essentially your block header hash, uh, is below this threshold value, only then it will be accepted by everyone else. Only then it will be seen as a, as a successful try and accepted, essentially appended to the blockchain versions of everyone else. Each newly created candidate block has a given probability to satisfy the criteria. Again, you cannot anticipate what you will end up with. So you just have to go with a trial and error approach and you have this certain probability depending on the, on the threshold value for each and every new try. And it's, it's not depending on what happened before um, this specific try. So for any given try, you have the same probability, essentially. It's a uh, Poisson distribution, as you will see in one of the next lectures. So what you're doing in this trial and error approach is you're just assembling new candidate blocks. You're computing the hash value. Uh, you're looking if you have a valid solution. You're looking if your hash value is below the threshold value. If yes, then you're good. If no, then you're uh, assembling a new candidate block and you're recomputing the hash value on the basis of this new candidate block. So what does it look like? Um, here we have a threshold value represented by a hexadecimal. Recall that this is a base 16 system. So with, um, with uh, 16 potential numbers for each position, oh, 029 and A2F. Uh, we could also represent that in a binary system, of course, where you have 256 bits, but it's just much more compact this way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's easier, much easier to understand when I when I show it this way. So um, assume that the threshold value, the current threshold value has here at the first position. So this zero X, you can ignore that. That's just basically signaling that it's hexadecimal. Uh, at the first position, you have a one, then um, essentially what you're saying is any hash value uh, that is lower than that, so any hash value that has as the first position has a zero, and then whatever behind that will be accepted, will be, uh, will satisfy this criteria, okay? So um, to be lower, of course, as I said, you must have a, a zero at the first position, and then generating a hash value from a given input, uh, each digit has a one in 16, chance, so 1 16th uh, to actually uh, end up being there at the first position. And this is also true for the zero, of course. So uh, you have a 1 16th chance, 1 16th probability that your first position will assume the value zero. Okay. Now, um, to find a solution um, that is below this threshold value right here, this one, um, the network would have on average to co compute 16 candidate blocks. Uh, every 16 candidate block on average would satisfy this criteria, would pass this trial and error phase and would be accepted by the network. Now, of course, you could make this, this criteria much stricter and we will talk about that later on. We will talk about the parameter. Uh, for example, if the first two positions in combination have to assume this value zero, uh, then it would be uh, 1 16th to the power of 2. When the first three positions in combination after you assume the value of a 0 will be 1 16th to the power of 3 and so on, okay? So it's really just this parameter. And as you will see later on, this parameter is adjusted uh, in a way to ensure that on average, uh, every 10 minutes, a new valid block is created. And the idea behind this 10 minute average, once again, is um, that when you're slowing down the block creation, the network has the time has the opportunity to actually exchange the information and to reach a common understanding uh, of the current state. Now, the iterative process of creating candidate blocks and checking their block header hash values against a threshold is called mining. So it's really not just the uh, assembly of these blocks, it's not just putting content in there, but it's also the activity of looking for these uh, hash values. And that is actually the part that is computationally intensive. It's not, it's not the validation of the transactions. It's not the cryptographic proofs. Uh, the one task with Bitcoin 
that actually uses up a lot of resources is this artificial speed decrease. It's this artif it's this this way of making the network artificially slower in order to ensure that it has the time it needs to reach consensus. And that's really what you need to do in a in a in a decentralized network. Um, you you must have some it doesn't necessarily have to be 10 minutes that's uh, for many applications quite excessive but you must have some time you must allow the network to actually have time to 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 reach this consensus and have a common understanding so um if the block header hash value you end up with so you, you assemble your block and put some contents in there then you're computing the hash value on basis of your block header hash if it's above or equal to the threshold you discard the candidate block you change the contents uh, i will talk about that more specifically and then you just recompute the new block header hash value you try again okay that's really this trial and error but uh, if your block header hash value is below the threshold uh, then you have successfully proposed a new block, um, assuming that all of the other contents also are valid, so that all of the cryptographic proofs hold. And then the uh, candidate block is relayed, propagated to the network, and the block can be appended to the to the chain of everyone else. So everyone else will receive it, it will be forwarded, forwarded, forwarded throughout the network, uh, and everyone who receives it will append it to their own uh, version of the blockchain, will append it to their sequence, uh, and then start the entire game, start the entire mining process, uh, where this most recent block actually is the foundation, uh, will be the status quo. So uh, it should become much clearer when we look at the process diagram and try to follow my laser pointer quickly. First of all, here on the left side, so really in this part right here, that is the private uh, view of the miner. That is what uh, one specific miner uh, does in private and then here on the right part later on that is what everyone else is doing um, and you can see that um, here we have the propagation of the block in between so when the miner has a successful block he actually sends it to everyone else but let's start right here at the top with the miner the first thing the miner does um, he or she looks at the transaction queue the personal transaction queue this mempool we've talked about last time picks some transactions uh, for inclusion into his or her candidate block uh, then uh, the miner checks if all transactions uh, that are part of this proposal are valid. That's really important because uh, he or she knows that everyone else will be able to also verify that later on. If not, um, then the miner uh, discards the, the invalid transactions and just pick new ones. If yes, then we proceed right here. Um, we adjust something called nonce. Um, for now, you only have to be aware that, that this is a, a number you can choose randomly. It uh, doesn't really matter. I will come back to that once again. Um, then once you have this nonce in there that is also part of the block header hash, uh, you compute the hash value. And excuse me, that is also part of the block header here, not the block header hash yet. Uh, you will compute the hash value on the basis of this block header. So with all the contents of the transactions, but also on the basis of this nonce. And then you check as the miner if the hash value, the resulting hash value, is below your threshold value. Now, in most cases, this will be a no. If yes, then uh, check pot. We will talk about it later on. But in most cases, it will be a no. And if it is a no, then you move back to this right here where you are adjusting the nonce. Okay. And uh, now it becomes clear what this nonce actually is. I've said earlier that it is just this, this arbitrary number you can pick. It doesn't really affect anything else. Um, but when you think about it, when you have a, a given candidate block, okay? So you're proposing a, a set of transactions. You're proposing a, a certain block. And then you see that you're ending up with a uh, hash value that doesn't satisfy the criteria. But you don't necessarily want to change any of its contents, any of its actual contents, like the transactions. Then you need some source of variation. Uh, because if you just take this, the exactly the same contents, when you just take the exact, exactly the same block header and hash it once again, uh, since hash functions are deterministic, you, win, you would end up with the exact same hash value. And this exact same hash value obvious, obviously wouldn't satisfy the, the criteria uh, because it hasn't satisfied it before. So you need some form, some sort of variation. And this is really this nonce. This is a, 
just an arbitrary number you can choose where you have some variation even if everything else in the block remains the same and once you uh, let's say uh, move this number this this nonce one up uh, so you go from one to two let's say um, and uh, it's also part of the block header and you compute the hash value on it the avalanche effect uh, will ensure that you end up with a completely different hash value. So you have this variation just by adjusting uh, the nonce and that's the entire idea of having this nonce. So you do that again and again and again and again and again and this is really where all of these resources are spent. This is really what we refer to as mining. This process right here, so this trial and error approach where, where you just um, computing and recomputing and recomputing and recomputing hash values until you end up with a valid solution with a, with a block header that results in a hash value um, that is below this threshold value. Once you've found one of these solutions, you propagate your block, uh, send it to everyone else. Everyone else will be uh, quite easily uh, able to verify if all the transactions are valid. They will be able to verify the script SIG. They will be very able to verify if you're only referencing unspent transaction outputs uh, in the transactions you have included. Uh, if no, then of course it's it's directly rejected. So right here. Um, but what's interesting is if it's yes, uh, then they are also able to compute the hash value. And this, in contrast to what you've done earlier, this can be done really efficiently. Why? Because here we're only talking about one single hash value. They only have to verify whether the, the block contents uh, you've sent them does in fact um, uh, lead to a hash value that satisfies the criteria that is below this threshold value. So they have to compute one single hash value. And recall that what you did before as a miner is this trial and error approach. And so one, computing one hash value is not expensive at all. You can do that. Uh, in, in fractions of a second, but uh, computing billions of it, computing an unbelievably large number of it, obviously takes some time. And that's exactly what you've done here on the left side. So it's, you have to prove that you have expended some amount of um, computational resources, that you've expended some amount of work uh, to construct the block. But the trick is that you can, once once it's there, it can be verified quite easily by everyone. So they just compute this hash value on this single block, see if the hash value is in fact below the threshold value, and if yes, they will accept it, and everything starts over again. So we just take the new block as the status quo, um, have have it as a uh, reference in the, in the uh, next candidate block, um, as, as I've shown you uh, with the block sequence with this chain, and then everything starts over again. So on the way this is adjusted to the, the threshold is, um, I've actually denoted it with delta right here. Uh, delta is just your threshold value. And obviously it's not adjusted in a, in a centralized manner. So you don't have, you, you do not have uh, uh, some authority that says, okay, today the threshold value is at the uh, number X and uh, now we change it, it it's, it's higher, it's lower. That would be really bad because that would introduce some centralized dependencies and obviously that's not something we want in a decentralized system. So instead of that, it's actually adjusted automatically um, and it's computed by all of the clients in parallel uh, following a specific set of rules. The idea is that the adjustment happens all 2016 uh, valid blocks. So on average, that's uh, when, when you have this 10 minute average I've been talking about, uh, it's every 14 days. Okay. Uh, so that's our expected time. We expect that this would happen every 14 days. And the new threshold value delta is then calculated or computed based on the expected value. So how long it should actually take, that would be the 14 days and the actual duration. So uh, the actual time it, it took uh, for these 2016 blocks to be mined. Okay, so we're, we're basically we're comparing our expected time. How long should it take um, when, when, we, when we're assuming these 10 minutes uh, to grade 2016 blocks and how long it actually uh, took by looking at these timestamps. And then um, what you end up with is you have this delta nu, that's the new threshold value uh, that uh, corresponds to delta all, that's the old threshold value uh, times the actual time, time it took uh, divided by the expected time. And the expected time we know that would just be uh, 2016 uh, times 10 in minutes, so that would be 
uh, these two weeks or 14 days and then you have the uh, actual time uh, to compare to that. Now what does it mean when you keep this equation in mind right here? Uh, then you have two situations uh, when the blocks are generated. Let me switch to my spotlight. When the when these blocks are generated faster than expected, so you have the actual time would be uh, smaller than what you would expect it. Uh, the, 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 what you have as an expected time, so you're really faster. Uh, then you have a situation where t divided by the expected t, so the actual time divided by the expected time, will be between zero and one. Why is that the case? Um, when the t right here is uh, smaller than et, then obviously this fraction has to assume values between zero and one. I mean that's that's quite easy to see. And when there is when this assumes values between zero and one, this means that the lower threshold value will lead to fewer accepted candidate blocks uh, in the following period. Why do I say that? Um, again, keep in mind this term right here, t divided by uh, expected t, and keep in mind that it has to be between zero and one. When we go back right here, uh, when this has to be this term right here, or right here has to be between zero and one, uh, then the delta nu will be something that is delta alt times uh, something in between zero and one. So it will get it will get smaller. We know that in this case delta nu uh, will be smaller than delta alt. And uh, of course, a smaller threshold value means that it will be harder to create new valid blocks. It means uh, that the criteria will be stricter. And when we do that, it has it has been faster, the process, than it should be. Uh, so for the last period, it, it took less than these 14 days. By making it stricter, uh, we should actually go back closer to this 10 minute average. On the other hand, when blocks are created slower than expected, so when the actual time it took is larger than the expected time, then e, uh, then t divided by the expected t will be larger than one, and this would lead to delta nu larger uh, than delta alt. Again, this is quite uh, easy to show. If this term right here is larger than one, then it would be something larger than one times delta alt equals delta nu, then of course delta nu would be larger than delta alt. And the, the reasoning behind that is uh, when when the actual time is, is higher than these 14 days, so when it took longer than it should, uh, then uh, you would uh, end up with less strict criteria, uh, so more candidate blocks would get accepted and you once again would move back closer to this 10 minute average. Um, what you will see in most cases is the difficulty that's actually just the inverse that is shown in many statistics right here that it's basically well, not not steadily, but it, it, it uh, let's say consistently increased and uh, this difficulty capital uh, D um, of I uh, is actually defined by the threshold value, the maximum threshold value at, at the Genesis block right here. Um, or the maximum threshold value that could potentially be assumed divided by uh, the, the threshold value at the current block. So it's really just the inverse. And that's why it, uh, when you have an increase in the difficulty, then you know that the threshold value actually had a decrease and vice versa. But that's most often that's the statistics you, you actually observe uh, when, when people talk about this increase in computational resources. Uh, it essentially solves three problems. Number one, um, we must have a system that allows us to create blocks within certain time intervals. Um, it cannot be too fast. Why can't it be too fast? If it's too fast, once again, um, then the creation, then the, the propagation, the exchange of information would lag behind. Uh, we would have the situation that we have seen at the end of the last slide deck, so everyone would just be working on their own on their own uh, version of the blockchain. On the other hand, when it's too slow, then we would severely uh, limit the transaction throughput. Uh, let's go with a situation where you have a new block only every uh, week. Uh, this means you couldn't have any updates in between, and that, but that would also be a bad situation. So we must have this self-adjusting um, uh, mechanism that I've shown you uh, 
that is part of the proof of work proposed by Satoshi, um, where on average you always come back to a some some of somewhat reasonable time frame, which in the case of Bitcoin is these ten minutes, uh, something that is neither too slow nor nor too fast, um, and therefore actually allows people to reach consensus, but also have a somewhat reasonable transaction throughput. Number two, the chain must be protected from simple replication. When you think about the chain structure I've shown you last time, uh, without any limitations, when you're just saying anyone can recompute uh, these blocks and the hash value doesn't really matter, uh, then of course it would be quite easy to, to replicate any of these, of these uh, blockchain, uh, or any of these blocks and replicate the entire blockchain. Um, once you introduce a certain requirement where you're saying we only accept blocks that are below this threshold value, um, you introduce some cost when, when people are trying to rebuild the blockchain because then uh, also the, the rebuilding process uh, would be uh, subject to this trial and error uh, task. So uh, recall that whenever you're trying to change something in the sequence, you are invalidating the current block, the one you're attacking, but also all of the subsequent ones in the sequence. And essentially when you have to rebuild all of them uh, and for, for each and every one of these blocks, you also have to provide a solution to this trial and error task. This will be quite costly. This will be computationally really intensive um, and uh, therefore quite a challenge to do so and, and really expensive to do so. And uh, last but not least, and this actually uh, is quite similar to what I just said, is a malicious behavior uh, in block creation should be discouraged, uh, or in other words, to phrase it more positively, uh, behavior where you're acting in accordance with the rules, with the consensus rules, should be encouraged. Okay, so basically you should give people an incentive uh, to act in accordance with the rules, to make sure that in an ideal world it is in their best self-interest to act in accordance uh, with the interest of the entire system. And that brings me to my last point, because something we have not talked about so far is that miners obviously do face costs. Um, they have to provide these computational resources, they have to do this trial and error process, uh, where they're computing and recomputing these hash values. So uh, no no one will just do that um, to provide a service to the system and they're not compensated. So we must, we must compensate these miners in some way. And the way this is done in the context of Bitcoin is through newly minted Bitcoin units. So basically whenever you're creating a block, you are allowed to add one transaction uh, that has no inputs and creates a new output, uh, a new UTXO um, on behalf of any unlocking condition um, of your choice. So usually um, with your Bitcoin address. And this consists, as I said, of newly minted Bitcoin units, but also of the transaction fees, which are the, uh, which is the difference between inputs and outputs uh, of any other transaction in your block. So these transaction fees that can be voluntarily added when somebody issues a transaction to incentivize you as a miner to include their transaction into your block, in your candidate block, you also get the value that is, that is in there. Um, this reward, so the first part of the reward, the newly graded Bitcoin units, um, is adjusted every 210,000 blocks. That is approximately every four year. If we uh, once again go with this 10 minute average uh, and this reward rate is halved uh, every, every uh, all four years, every four years. Initially, it started at 50 Bitcoin per block. And you can see that right here, that was this. It's, it's really hard to hit that accurately with this remote, I'm really sorry. Uh, but it's not like a physical one. It's it's it has a really bad responsiveness, and that's why I uh, have a hard time actually pointing to what I want to show you. But here we go. This initial growth rate, that's the the 50 Bitcoin uh, per block. Then we had here 25 Bitcoin per block, right here, 12 and a half Bitcoin per block, uh, 6.25, 6.25, and so on. Okay. So the idea is that it gets halved. The reward is halved every four years every 210,000 blocks. And then of course you have this convergence to a certain number and this certain number. And in the case of Bitcoin is these 21 million uh, you keep hearing about. 
Um, it's not specifically coded that there will only ever be 21 million, but it's something that is implicit in the code uh, when you're computing this convergence, when you're looking at uh, this reward halving. Uh, in the year 2040, um, it will be a, a quasi zero growth. And in, um, in the year 2140, um, there, that's of course a, a big if, uh, we, 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 it's a really long, long time period. We have no idea if Bitcoin uh, will exist for that long. Uh, but if it still exists at this point in time, 2140, um, then we, that would be when the last fractions, uh, so, so Bitcoin has, um, is divisible with eight positions behind the comma. That was when the last fraction would be mined and when there wouldn't be any more newly minted Bitcoin whatsoever or fractions thereof. And at that point, uh, even before that, I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter when you just have these small fractions. But uh, eventually, uh, the transaction fees would really be the uh, only incentive the miners would get. Uh, so they would be incentivized by these transaction fees, but not anymore by newly created, newly minted Bitcoin units. All right, um, that is the paper by Dwork and Nar. I've been talking about the uh, um, paper where that essentially proposed uh, uh, these trial and error mechanism, this trial and error approach for uh, combating spam email and denial of service attacks that l later led to the proof of work consensus algorithm. And also, of course, it's always a good time to revisit the original Satoshi paper where the proof of work consensus algorithm has been proposed. So that's it. Stay curious. See you soon.